cutting worker wages is always seen as a strategy to, you know, save costs. We all hopefully know that that is a very short term way of looking at costs. And I think this is what our study proves. We're going to be talking about prevailing wage um, and uh, prevailing wage. Maybe that sounds a little bit too, you know, I don't know, boring or whatever, but the impacts are real. The impacts are important. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, once you understand what it means, it's not really that boring um, because the, the gist of it is, do you want construction workers to make more money and do you want them to be safe or do you not? And that's... That's not boring. That's pretty relevant to not only construction workers, but also to, uh, you know, people in their community, people who maybe care somewhat about people other than themselves. Right. And so here to talk to us about prevailing wage laws is Dr. Larissa Petrucci, a uh, Ph.D., postdoctoral research associate, or formerly was that, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is currently now with the NorCal Construction Industry Compliance Organization. Uh, Dr. Larissa, thank you so much for taking your time uh, to talk to us today. Excited to have you. So the name of the study that you did for the Illinois Economic Policy Institute is titled the economic impact of prevailing wage law repeals on construction market outcomes, evidence from repeals between 2015 and 2018. You did this with uh, Frank Manzo the fourth, the executive director at Economic Policy Institute in Illinois, and Robert Bruno. Um, and so the the first thing I guess you know, and I, and I kind of I did a little bit of a summary, but but help us understand maybe a bit more clearly what prevailing wage is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for kind of setting it up. And I know the title isn't the flashiest title, but <laughs> the content I think is really relevant, I hope, to all your listeners and beyond your listeners. Um, so yeah, let's talk about construction. So construction, first of all, massive industry that highly affects all of us, given that it's you know, contributing to building the world around us that we uh, live in, that we, you know, have coffee and that we go to work in, that we drive on. So already I would say like, you know, just this hugely important sector. So construction has some unique components that are, um, that kind of set it apart from other sectors or industries. So when we're talking about public works construction projects, we're talking about projects that are funded by the public through taxpayer dollars um, that governments decide to award to, you know, specific awarding bodies um, in order to build a project uh, that is going to benefit the taxpayers. So that is really at the heart of these public works projects is making sure that money paid for by taxpayers is being used um, appropriately on these public works projects. So the process for kind of making sure um, a contractor is, you know, going to be a good fit for the project is they have to, you know, fill out a bid packet where they say why they're a good fit for the job and, you know, what the job is going to cost. Well, the way it works in public works construction is that the lowest bidder pretty much automatically wins. So what does that mean? It means that the contractor has all of the incentive to lower the cost as much as possible. And one way that we know employers are always trying to lower the cost is to squeeze the worker. Um, so in order to kind of protect construction worker wages, the construction industry has this kind of unique minimum wage um, system called prevailing wage. Um, so what prevailing wage really does, it just is a way to determine what is the most common or the prevailing wage in that local economy and say that, you know, if you're gonna have a public works project specifically that's paid for by taxpayers, let's make sure that all the contractors are paying that same wage so they can't come in and undercut wages. Um, so that's, you know, most broadly what prevailing wage is. Um, should I stop there? Do you want me to keep kind of going into a few more pieces? No, I think I think that's a really good uh, that's a really good setup, and and you know it, it's it, it's pretty intuitive. Prevailing wage, what it you know it, what is what does prevailing mean? What does wage mean? And so you know most people, if you think through it, you're going to kind of get the gist of what it is, and and basically the effect is that it has it 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 brings up the wage floor and and makes it more difficult for employers to pay below that, and and makes it easier for 
contractors who want to do right by their employees to bid on a project successfully, right? Because if I'm a if I'm a contractor and I'm wanting to do right, I'm wanting to pay my workers well, that's going to cost a certain amount of money. And if somebody else, some fly-by-night contractors comes in and says, well, I'm going to pay my workers $8 an hour or whatever, uh, and, and then the government is forced to accept the lowest bidder, well, then maybe that undercuts my ability to uh, to bid and and pay workers well. And then also that's going to actually end up, you know, if you're paying construction workers eight dollars an hour, it's going to be difficult to retain those types of folks uh, that's in that type of industry. And so maybe they don't have the type of training. Maybe they're not able to do the job as safely. Maybe they're not able to do the job as uh, with as high a quality as you would get if you were able to pay somebody more. Walk us through some. Walk us through some of those implications and and why we know that they're there. You know specifically as it relates to quality and safety. Uh, th- those effects when it comes to prevailing wage laws. Sure. Yeah. So just to back up a, a bit and to kind of talk about you know the repeals. Um, we can kind of set up why we did this particular study. So you know as we both have now kind of mentioned. Uh, you know, cutting worker wages is always seen as a strategy to, you know, save costs. Um, We all hopefully know that that is a very short term way of looking at costs. And I think this is what our study proves. So really what happened between 2015 and 2018, um, six states decided to repeal their state prevailing wage laws or to say, you know what, we're not going to mandate that contractors bidding on public works um, pay their workers this kind of, you know, wage that helps to stabilize these local markets. Um, Those who were in favor of the repeal, governors and state legislators, kind of made a promise to taxpayers um, that cutting out these middle class wages um, and benefits to construction workers would save them money on construction projects. And sure, the logic seems, you know, somewhat obvious enough. You don't pay workers as much. You don't have as much of your tax dollars um, being used uh, for these projects and perhaps you can have more projects. So we decided to test that and to kind of do um, one of the first studies to really look at all of the states that repealed these laws and compare them to the 28 states, including the District of Columbia, who has maintained their prevailing wage laws. So we wanted to see, okay, there's this promise that it's gonna save money, what actually happened? Um, So, you know, kind of broadly what happened is there were negative impacts for the workers, for the um, employers and for the community. So construction worker earnings and productivity fell behind states that maintained their prevailing wage laws, on the job fatalities increased, um, and reliance on government assistance programs increased, which essentially means you know, taxpayers are you know, now kind of shifting where their dollars are going instead of you know, right in the pockets of workers through the wages and kind of into these government assistance programs. Um, it slowed down employment growth and fewer projects were completed by local contractors. Um, so, you know, if we want to focus kind of first on the, the training element, one component of a state prevailing wage law it, is that it requires contractors to contribute a small amount to a training fund um, to assist in apprenticeship training. Um, and in these like state sponsored apprenticeship programs, you really have a requirement to Um, engage in very rigorous kind of training uh, to ensure safety on these jobs. You know, construction is one of the most unsafe jobs that one can have. So it's really important to have really strong safety standards that come from this apprenticeship um, training. So when you take away that kind of model for contributing to training, what you're doing is creating a more unsafe environment as workers are not as well equipped to um, work in their environments safely. Um, And kind of as you were saying, Jacob, what actually ended up happening after 2018 into the pandemic is this massive labor shortage, this recognition by workers that we're not gonna continue to work for employers who do not pay us a reasonable wage, who are making us work in unhealthy environments and to not offer us benefits. Um, so, you know, really without having this kind of way to attract workers, paying them again, just the local prevailing wage, uh, you really are kind of missing out on an opportunity to make use of these, you know, federal investment programs that are, you know, beginning now um, and really just kind of closing the pipeline of workers to to the jobs. And this is something that is 
you know, it, it, it's relevant to our audience in, in, a, in a few kind of kind of roundabout ways. I mean, for one, I uh, mentioned this to mention this to you when we spoke on the phone uh, the other day is we just had a construction worker die. And, and actually, there was a construction worker die a few weeks even before that. But the one that most recently that I'm thinking of is is uh, Torobio Perez. Um, he died in a construction project off of Old Monrovia Road. It wasn't a government project, but it was, we know for a fact, a non-union contractor. And that is one of the effects that you say of, of that your study shows and that you say you know, th this study is consistent with other literature in this area, with other peer-reviewed literature in this area that shows these effect of repealing prevailing wage projects. And yet, you know, this literature has been out there. People have known this. And people are still pushing back against these protections for construction workers, whether it be attacking prevailing wage laws, whether it be attacking project labor agreements, as our governor did a few months ago uh, when she attacked uh, uh, Joe Biden's executive order mandating project labor agreements on federal construction over $35 million. And one of the things that prevailing or that project labor agreements includes is prevailing wage. And, you know, so, the, it, it, and, and like you said, it's not just relevant to, um, to construction workers or to people through just the, the, you know, human empathy. Like I care about other people because I'm a human and that's what humans do, but it's also the productivity decreased. Uh, the, you know, the number of projects that they were able to perform decreased. These are actually like directly, even if we just don't care about people, these are not helping the people that these uh, repeals are supposed to help. They're supposed to help the taxpayer pay less and get more done. And that's just factually not, what, not what's happening. And you know what's so interesting, Jacob, is that in the construction industry, another kind of unique component is that labor costs actually make up less than a quarter of the total cost of a project um, because so much of the cost is determined by materials. Um, so, you know, when you really have a, a law or a repeal of a law that's focused on shrinking the wages of the workers, that's really not going to be a very smart economic, uh, you know, program because it doesn't actually hit what is raising the cost in the construction industry. Um, and, you know, interestingly, actually a... Um, a Republican leader in the Indiana House of Representatives, uh, uh, Ed Soliday, actually did admit that after they got rid of the prevailing wage law, it didn't save them a penny. That's exactly what he said. Mm. And, you know, I think what these repeals show us um, alongside, you know, other kinds of of you know, ways to squeeze workers more by lack of benefits, lack of training, um, just general lack of investment in workers um, as, you know, as workers who can be both productive, safe, and paid an appropriate wage, it's just a short-term strategy. It's just this very, very um, short-sighted way to think about, okay, how do we save money and cut corners um, without any recognition of the long-term impacts of, you know, losing this pipeline of workers, having, um, you know, lower quality projects. You know, I'm in California right now, and I don't know if you all have seen on the news there that, you know, there are people who are rafting through San Francisco because of the, mm. you know, the, the rain that's being ca caused as our, you know, climate continues to change. And I just think that it's, you know, very unwise to take shortcuts in the construction industry, as we know that climate is going to increasingly, you know, not be really aligned with the kinds of it, you know, built environment that we have right now. We're going to need hmm. new infrastructure that is going to, you know, make sure that we're all safe in this context. So I think it's very, very dangerous to target construction in particular um, to uh, cut corners. Right. And not only that Republican leader that you mentioned, uh, this uh, Jim Justice from West Virginia said the same thing a few years ago. I don't know if you remember that, but I just I just looked it up. It was from uh, 2021. And he said, quote, we passed the right to work law in West Virginia and we ran to the windows looking to see all the people that were going to come and they didn't come. We got rid of the prevailing wage. We changed our corporate taxes and we've done a lot of different things and we've run to the windows and they haven't come. And that's the rub, right? That that screwing over workers, it doesn't even give what it promises. 
right? That, you know, it doesn't even attract businesses in the way that people pretend it will. It's just bad for workers and bad for the community. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think too, you know, construction is such an amazing opportunity for, um, for really, especially young workers who are not sure what they want to do after they graduate high school, mm. for example, you know, this is an industry that you can get an apprenticeship training and earn while you learn one of the mm -hmm. only, you know, still uh, remaining, you know, training programs where it's not an unpaid internship um, where you're, you're actually going to get, you know, paid a, a reasonable wage while you, you know, learn on this job and you do it without debt. You know, you don't go to a four year college and accrue, accrue all this debt, um, you know, and who knows what even happens after that. So this is like this pipeline to, you know, these really strong, well-paying jobs that can really, you know, really support families. And you're, you know, by repealing this prevailing wage law, you're just completely getting rid of that pipeline. You're, you're taking something that is a career and trying to make right. it into this very short term, almost, you know, gig like kind of job. It just completely mm -hmm. changes the nature of this occupation in a way that I think um, just, yeah, really, really does a disservice to um, to workers. Absolutely. And one of the more and I, I want to dig in really quickly to um the t two of the more maybe ancillary things that people wouldn't immediately think of, you know, OK, so so I'm going to repeal prevailing wage and workers wages are going to go down. I think that seems pretty intuitive to people, but they hope that there's these other benefits. But one of the other things that you mentioned is fatalities increasing. Um, talk to us about talk to us about that and, and how it is that this happens and, and what's the degree of fatalities increasing. Right, exactly. So thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, so the construction industry on the job fatality rate was 14% higher in states that pre uh, repealed their prevailing mm. wage um, compared to states that maintain them. So yeah, we were also, you know, to be honest, a bit surprised at how big of a finding that was. And I think it really, again, just speaks to the importance of this training that the apprenticeship programs um, really provide to workers. These Programs require workers to go through OSHA training and, you know, it really leads to, as we can see, safer outcomes. Now, you know, another thing that I will say isn't necessarily in the data, but, uh, you know, a conclusion that one could logically come to is that if your, you know, overall framework for how you understand uh, you know, workers in this industry is let's cut their wages, cut costs as much as possible. You're just not investing in a high quality process, a high quality mm -hmm. way of producing a good. It's an overall framework of let's do the cheapest thing possible and cut as many corners possible. So I would imagine that, you know, um, contractors who are in states that are not really focused on protecting workers, um, you know, are creating conditions where fatalities are more likely to happen. Right, right. And what about this that um, after prevailing wage repeals, <clears throat> public works projects were more likely to go to out of state contractors? Talk to us about that. How is it that that happens? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, really what happens again is that prevailing wages are a way to stabilize local markets. Um, but when you take that away, you really allow for contractors to kind of undercut these markets. Um, so if you have contractors in states where they don't want to have to pay, you know, whatever the wages they're required to pay, they'll go to states where it's cheaper, where they know that they can cut the corners um, and, you know, pay, pay workers the lowest wage possible so that they can be the lowest bidder on the project and win the project. Um, so yeah, you see more out-of-state contractors coming in, undercutting these local markets, winning the projects. And then, you know, again, these are taxpayer um, projects taking the money that they earn and spending it in their own community. So, you know, not only are local contractors being kind of cut out of local projects built for their communities, um, there's also less spending in that local community. So that's, you know, another kind of way that this is not just a law that affects um, the workers of the industry, but all workers in all industries, because it really does have a ripple effect. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point that and and this this is a this leads to another question that I wanted to ask is that opponents of of things like 
prevailing wage and project labor agreements, they say, oh, this unfairly advantages union contractors. It means that only union contractors can bid on these projects. And that's just not the case, right? No, I mean, the case is, if you want to have a competitive market, you need to be able to pay competitive wages. And if you're not able to pay what the competitive wage is, the prevailing wage, then you're not a competitive contractor. That's that's just how it works. Right, right. And and so, you know, that it, it's not it, it's just saying you've got to pay your workers this much. It's not saying that you they've got to be union or you have to be a signatory with the union. You know, you can do that or, or not. You just have to pay your workers this much or you or for PLAs, you just have to agree to this and that and the other thing. But it doesn't say that your workers have to be, you know, that you have to become a union contractor to bid on these projects. And when you do that, when you bring up that wage that that, you know, like you mentioned, it, it doesn't just help construction workers because that changes that does change the labor market. You know, if I'm if I'm looking if I'm a worker and I'm not necessarily I haven't, you know, uh, uh, become in my mind a construction worker. I'm just entering the market and I'm saying, yeah, well, you know, I could go do this job for $17 an hour or I could become a construction worker. Well, if a construction worker pays more, then that is going to put other pressure on these other employers, right? And make them have to pay more to attract the new talent. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, to be honest, this isn't something that we talk about in our study, but as a person who has done a lot of schooling and is, you know, waiting to have to start paying on my student loans, I think it's really important <laughs> to, you know, kind of shift this um, this debt pipeline to jobs yeah. and really focus on these programs that are going to be able to provide good paying jobs after the training um, and really kind of show a different model. And, you know, we're not going to go to into education and the education model here. But I think the logic is the same that, you know, investing in training does have positive outcomes for productivity alongside, of course, the outcomes of, you know, having workers be highly skilled um, for the jobs that they're doing, especially jobs um, that include, you know, the, the houses we live in right. and the places mm -hmm. we work and the roads that we drive on. Yeah, seems like that's important. Um, <laughs> just a couple more questions before we let you go. Uh, the, uh, this one is about kind of the structure of prevailing wage, and and I guess ju it, it's it's important enough to just to just set it out that there are, there's two different prevailing. There's a federal prevailing wage, and there's also a state level prevailing wage. And so what we're talking about right now is the effects of the repeal of state level prevailing wage, which Alabama repealed our prevailing wage at the state level several years back, but uh, we still have a federal prevailing wage, which is set by the Federal Department of Labor based on, you know, the county area. Um, uh, and that, but that's only for purely federal contract or purely federal contracts. Uh, whereas, you know, so if it's joint funded with state and federal, federal doesn't count for prevailing wage, it's only federal. Uh, and then other states might have, you know, like if, if this other state had a state level prevailing wage, then presumably their state Department of Labor would determine it for each region. Is that right? Gotcha. OK, good, good. Just wanted to make sure that, that I laid that out there. And, and yes, Alabama does not have a state level prevailing wage. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to ask you is um, we had a few people in the in the chat, uh, Sid, um, and Christine asked, are you running for office? Um, <laughs> how great it would be to vote for somebody like this. Um, you know, so uh, is are you like launching a, a campaign right now? <laughs> is, is that what's happening? That great, <laughs> great question. I'm not launching a campaign, but I do hope to continue contributing to kind of the data behind, um, you know, dispelling myths. I think it's a really fun job to get to say like, OK, here's a promise that you made for taxpayers and workers. Let's look at the data, see what's happening happened and, you know, test your promise. So I have a lot of fun dispelling myths. Awesome. I, I think it's great. I love the work. Uh, feel free to, you know, send me anything, uh, uh, anything else along the, along these lines that you have in the future. And we'd love to bring you back on. Uh, Dr. Larissa Petrucci, we appreciate your time and look forward to talking to you. Again. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. 
We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm.